Um, we've got two different materials. So I've got hair moss, communis, and willow, salix species. And so we're just going to make circles, aren't we? We're going to make circles. Yes. We'd like you to make circles. And we'd like you to, once you've made one circle, we'd like you to go and meet somebody else. And we'd like you to make a circle together. Connect. Connect with them. And then you can both go to somebody else and get another piece and connect with them as well. So you can choose what you want to do. Yeah, so for a circle like that. So basically, this is how we introduced our woven symposium communities, woven community symposium people to each other. We had about 50 of them, and um, we thought we'd get you to also get to know each other this way. And we had exactly the same problem that nobody would stop. And once they actually started making things, it was really difficult to stop people fiddling and doing things and so on. Um, but the Woven Communities Project began when Liz Balfour and I, <laughs> sorry Liz, um, of the, Liz of the Scottish Basket Maker Circle called a meeting to see if any of the group was interested in collecting together all the different sources of information that the group had already put together um, into some kind of publishable form. So I don't know if you want to just talk briefly about that meeting. I'm trying to be And I'll just talk a little bit about the Scottish Basket Maker Circle, which is it's our 25th birthday this year, so we've been to enable people to learn about basket making, make baskets. And we found ourselves very much in keep maintaining traditional crafts, but we have some very good contemporary basket makers, so we haven't got stuck in the past. So we try to move on. And uh, over the course of these years, we've become very aware of how much is being lost and how very quickly. I was just talking to a gentleman over here about the same happening in, in India, how, you know, we're all more hurrying on to the modern world and we are losing track. All done over the centuries, many thousands of years. And so we started the project to try and put this together. And we started, it's really it's called the book group, isn't it? But it's kind of like grown and grown and grown. And I like to say, students, students here say this is the basket maker circle has grown. I haven't gone to university now. And Stephanie has sort of taken us in hand and become an enabler, really, Stephanie, I would say, collecting a lot of stuff. And we've also got a website which we're putting a lot of our information on. But we're it's a sort of project that's come from a little tiny idea, partly through this funding, and largely through the funding, really, that's enabled Stephanie to become involved in it. And it just have a symposium where we got together the academics, we got the museum curators, a very handy bunch of people to know, and the practical basket makers. Very good in St. Andrews, wasn't it, Stephanie? Yeah. And as we've developed the project more, we've got a website. We're already getting feedback on that website from people who are telling us things we would never have found out. So it's become a very, very worthwhile project. Yeah. This project that has got legs yeah. is, is going on. Okay. So that's all I've said. Thank you. We're going to yes. make things as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I went to this meeting that the, the Basket Makers Group called, and I was dragged on by my husband. And um, I guess I, I felt that there wasn't just a story about the kind of the loss of basketry. It wasn't just a sort of um, cultural revival or the process of salvage ethnography. Um, but there's also, I'm an anthropologist, and I thought there was also a really important anthropological um, story here of intergenerational learning, different ways of intergenerational learning through different means, through basketry, through uh, an intersection between basket makers, museum curators, ethnobotanists, and so on. And when we just kind of felt that, in a sense, you've got this basket, but also you've got this community that's woven together. Uh, so the baskets in Scotland, anyway, weave together fishing communities, different aspects of fishing communities, crofting communities, um, farming communities, industrial communities, um, travellers, and uh, people who got into the home industry, 
and also anthropologists, curators, craft professionals, just enthusiasts. Um, and then there was also this whole load of embodied knowledge that people had, that people like Julie and Liz have, all this kind of understanding of practice. Um, so uh, all the kind of process of making things, whether it's like making rope or travellers making potato baskets with split wood or, or people, blind workshops, people making uh, materials out of willow. And there's a sort of whole knowledge about what there is out in the environment there in Scotland, our understanding of the local ecology, which is completely gone uh, in relation to the, this important knowledge in relation to our local bio environment, if you like. So um, I guess that was the approach that actual Scottish basket makers last autumn gathering where they were doing workshops, doing um, reconstructions. So anyway, we got the grant. We decided to apply for the grant to do this research. We got it, which was a big surprise. And um, we found that um, four things came up, which was uh, that we wanted to talk to you about, really. And one of those was the collaboration that we had between the university and the basket makers. One of them was the symposium, uh, the website, and also the kind of future potential of the project. I think we, we, the reason why we're here now, and why Julie and um, Liz are both working, is that we, we felt we wanted to put baskets right at the heart of the project. We felt that making things, we couldn't just do it about, and I think I heard somebody else say this in a previous session, it wasn't just about baskets and basket makers, it had to have basket makers in it. And, and that was a critical aspect of our, of our collaboration, really. And I, I don't think you were going to add something about, about that. Um, yeah, but I'll just... Um say how well, I've been a basket maker for about 12 years now and all, most of that time I've been part of the Scottish Basket Makers Circle and um, we found as basket makers I think we found that like, we picked up bits of knowledge about traditional basket making skills some of which have been lost but when we teach uh, classes people People at all the classes start talking about their memories or the memories of their grandparents making baskets or using baskets. And also when we get to museums, as basket makers, we always notice the baskets in the museums. So there's all these bits of knowledge from basket makers all around Scotland. So we get together at a gathering sometimes, but, um, and we sort of share that knowledge informally, but what we wanted to do is sort of bring it all together. And Stephanie, Stephanie getting involved has really enabled us to sort of do that in a big way. Great, and um, and from my point of view, I've sort of been involved informally, um, sort of voluntary, um, over the last several months. Um, with Stephanie. And in the last, in the build-up to this showcase, I've actually um, got paid for that six, just six days' work um, to sort of help put all this knowledge together on the website and sort of stuff. And um, that's really been great because it's it's meant because up till then it was a great project, but it did sort of feel like it was Stephanie's project in a way, even though we were sort of involved in it. But now the few of us that have got paid, we're much much more involved, we've much more ownership of the project in a way. And so that's just been great. And I've been able to um, have time to write articles based on the research I've done and um, help and discuss with um, Stephanie the stuff that she's put on it help me clarify different points that I may have even more knowledge about. So um, we can sort of clarify that on the website and stuff. So that's just what I want to say, really. The whole project's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, I think we, we just, we, 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 we did find, though, like, my anxieties as, a, as an academic were, oh my god, I've got to fulfil this grant. Um, but the other side of it was, was that all the people I was working with weren't getting paid at all, which is very difficult as an empowerment issue in relation to people, the community that you're working with, and the amount of time they can work, and, and, and it, it, it's, it's very difficult um, to sort of make it fair, I think. So I thought that was very important. We just, before we do another practical bit, we just wanted to talk about our symposium. Um, I mean, what happened when I, I was talking about symposium to another basket maker who's called Kay, Kay Anderson, and Kay said to me, well, I will come to the symposium, Stephanie, but I will only come if I can sit and make my basket during the symposium. So I thought, right, um, so I thought, well, that's actually a really good idea, and because it's good, it's, it's good doing things while you think, and so 
what we did at the symposium was we wrote and asked all the speakers, all the international speakers, if they didn't mind not having any um, kind of media access during the presentations, but would they mind people making baskets during, during the discussion. And um, that's what we did. And we also did this thing of getting people to do practical stuff. And actually, it was great, and we found that even really international speakers like Willoughby Wendron, who came over from the University of California, who was talking about the archaeology of the Egyptian baskets, you couldn't actually get her from the floor to speak and do her paper because she was so interested in the practice. And I think also we just found that what we that it somehow united our thought processes, so that it actually aided thought. The process of making helped thought and it helped discussion, and um, it was just. Very, a very important aspect of what we do uh, of, the, of the symposium. So this is another way we're really putting basketry at the heart of this. So we, we also got, just to go back to you, we, we, we asked you to come and to demonstrate during the entire uh, event. You as a, a Shetland basket maker who makes baskets out of straw kishis um, and very good basket maker. And the symposium included, it, it was very important to us that it enabled us also to position our research on Scotland within an international arena and at the same time, it, it brought in um, people from abroad who could learn about our project and learn from it. So, just had something here of, um, so I'll just run through those and try and get to go on out, didn't I? Just wanted to show you a couple of things from the So, we had Ian Tate from Shetland Museum, for example. Um, just give you a couple of days. Uh, if there's anyone here from Orkney, uh, from the head of these as well as from Shetland, this is a familiar old stand that, uh, and so on. <laughs> I could have shown you half an hour's worth of slides of woman with basket of peats with knitting and walking. It's, it's so sad, it's so stereotypical, it's not inaccurate. I'm not saying it didn't happen, it happened all the time, but is there one picture of the ship and the mucking of the buyer? No. <laughs> that happened all the time. <laughs> what we really need to do is to look at things in the economic context, and that's how we understand why all these huge different numbers of baskets were made at all. Uh, the model there just came out. I just wanted to show you another clip from a local museum curator from Amstrad Museum, Fisheries Museum, because we have these different practices. We have proper fisher people, we have east coast fisher people, we have farmers and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're, you're single line and it's many books and you can see examples of some of the fantastic words that are used there and so on. And there were two main techniques. The first was small line fishing. This was a family affair. Generally, the woman was involved in preparing the gear for fishing. Um, they would be out collecting mussels to use as bait, and then they would coil, or put them onto a chip, and then coil the baskets into these, uh, the coiled lines into these baskets. Um, and you can see a great variety of the baskets there. This is St. Andrew's um, up on the harbour. Um, the line could be up to a mile in length and it might have about 1,200 hooks on it. So she could be up in the, in the early hours collecting mussels just for, for, for a line. Um, this, was, um, this was done inshore and each man would probably have about two skulls to take on board with the lines. Um, the, fish, the, the, the children were sometimes involved because when they were, late, when they were coiling the line into the baskets, they would layer them with grass in between times um, so that they didn't get tired. Okay, so just, just to give you a flavour really of the kind of issues that come up and the kind of things that people want to talk about. Now, are there any questions so far about the project? Because if not, we're going to go on to our second practical. <laughs> <laughs> this, um, what I'm doing is, is twining or making flossy simmons, which is made from field brush. Now I've got some field brush, which is the little short brush, 
and I've also got some English brush, so we've got two different kinds of brush. But um, this is what grows on Shetland. This is some of it's actually plants. Some of it's red. And um, frankly, nothing else grows on Shetland much. You know, there's no trees. Everybody says that they really are. And um, so they use this rather short stubbing to bend things to field brush, which was made into twine or cinnamon. And then in the basket, uh, I didn't think of bringing a kit that gives you down, but unfortunately it's a bit fragile. The basket's made of straw, and then it's twined, held together with, with cinnamon. So if you make a Shetland Kishi, which I have done, I'm just using a visual, you have to spend two days making cinnamon. Because, you know, that's how you make it, it's all done by hand. 22 fathoms, isn't it? 22 fathoms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So these, uh, this is a very, very traditional ancient technique. We don't know how old, we have no idea. You know, and we don't know, we never find old kishis because they just rot. Get your show the technique. So you, you show it, you go, we'll get everybody to... And Julie is going to have the most cut into this. <laughs> you get a bundle of a three or four in each hand, I don't Turn them so that you've got, like, they're like that, you've got all the tip ends and that end, so you want to turn half so they're like, you've got the ends, the fat ends at different points. And then you're going to bend that over. Shall I hold it? I'll show you how I do it with one, <laughs> just myself, but you might need to do it in pairs. Um, so you've got two bundles like that, and you, you twist, well, I do it if you're right handed, you twist the right hand one away from you and then bend it over the other bundle. And so then you get the other one, then twist that away from you, and then pull it forwards. And twist that away from you, pull it forwards. So you can see it's starting to make a rope. So, and the other, the other way you can do it is... Um, I'm doing the same as you do. Yeah. If you want to do it in pairs, you'd get... You do the same thing to start with, and you get someone. If you hold, you hold that point there, you can just you twist the right hand one, cross it over the other one, cross them over, twist the right hand one, cross them over, twist the right hand one, cross them over. Okay? It's just like spinning and plying. Then when it's done, has anybody done that spin? And if you let go, you see it doesn't come under those stays. So if you, want, if you want to have a go, it comes out of the dog. who no longer practiced or who had died. And there's all this different kind of knowledge. Well, this might have met um, an academic like Hugh Cheap at Edinburgh University, uh, Edinburgh Museum. And, and then he'd gone off in a different direction to the University of Highlands and Ireland. So there's all this information scattered over Scotland. And um, a lot of it was known about in the places where there were basket makers, because basket makers seemed to do this research of their own. And um, so we wanted to get a kind of a, something that would kind of allow all the people who had done work to, to be able to own the project. So that pe the people who had done research, whether they were completely um, not academics or whether they were academics, they wouldn't feel competed against by other people. So what we wanted was to use the website to sort of pull together something for a compendium. That, that's the plan, really, I would say, I think, really. And um, so that's the way we went, and so we used WordPress, and I don't know how many people here have used WordPress. 
Yeah, it's a sort of bloggy website, which none of us have done anything to do with webs. Well, Julie's a bit good on Facebook, but we, we, hadn't, done, we hadn't done websites before. And we, we got the university basically gave us the, the, our school web designer to, to help set the under, underneath the infrastructure up. And we then formed a WordPress site, which has a blog on it and, and has lots and lots of, you can see along the, sort of the, the navigation bar, all the topics that we thought were important in relation to baskets. So basket types, we've got a pin map, all the different Scottish regions and the differences, how to make baskets. And each of those sections we've got some stuff on. It's still going, and I think we've, you know, probably not until the end of this year we really got even a sort of really comprehensive total compendium together. Um, and, but it's really helped us order our minds, I think, and, and helped us work out what is and isn't there, and also figure out what we need and the gaps that we need. Because the last um, few weeks, as I said, I've been working on a website, and we put loads, you know, because we've had this bit extra bit money, we put the intern door and start here, put loads of stuff up onto the website, and this information of the time we put up before now. But what, what's been quite exciting is that beginning to realise that um, apart from a way of gathering everything and showing people the information we've found out, it's also triggering other information to come to us and um, people sending stuff and in conjunction with things like Facebook as well, it's, it's quite interesting what's happening and I've just, um, for example, on Facebook there was, we've got a lot of American people that like our Facebook page <laughs> and there's one American woman um, she wrote a message asking if we knew anything about these shopping baskets that her aunt, that she remembers her aunt using in Glasgow. She's got aunts, um, aunts in Glasgow. And I said, we haven't really got much information from Glasgow because it's not a basket maker there that we, that's really involved at home. And so I said, we didn't really know about these, but um, she could look at our website. So she looked at her website and she found, she sent a message back saying it was. Uh, this one, um, it was a basket like this, which we had on our website, and we didn't know that the, that, that was a basket that was used in Glasgow, and it's called, we call it the sky, what's called the sky basket, some places they call it a head basket. Um, so that's quite exciting, she said that once said that they had different styles in different areas, so that's something else we can find out about. Um, another example is um, on Facebook, someone Posted um, on Facebook, I'll just scroll down. This picture, which is a great picture of live baskets that uh, we've had. So the symposium talking about earlier, and that's, we haven't got a picture like this of one actually being the, the, um, the line being faded and then coiled into the basket on the left. So that's great as well. Um, we also got um, there's an artist in the north of Scotland who's interested in baskets and she's the pictures a member of her she? Yeah. And um, she is doing a residency at um, a museum in Strathnaber, which is on the north, somewhere up north. It's got a little bit up And um, she's, she used our website to find out that the baskets in this museum, which she's using as inspiration for the work she's doing, were lime baskets. And um, she put on her blog a that picture of all the baskets um, that are in this museum. So I emailed her and said, oh, can, we get, can you see if we can get individual pictures of these baskets for our galleries on the website? And she's going to find out about that. But when she realised how interested we were, she sent this email, which um, has got all these links to different museums up in the north of Scotland that um, have got basket collections that she knows about and we didn't really you know about them. And also, this link at the bottom, which is to a, a picture archive, a photo archive, and it's got, which has got pictures like this. And so that's a whole, you know, we've got, just from that one person, we've got a whole huge area of research that we can carry on, you know, more information to find out. And it's through the website and our communications with people that it's to be So, um, 
cancel plates so I hope you know, the next I hope what we're hoping to put before on the website so these interactions can actually happen on the website rather than having to go to Facebook and emails and stuff so everyone can see them. So um, yeah, I think that's what I wanted to say. Yeah and that, that, that was also I mean, one of the questions that we had like when we started doing this project you find there's all these kind of received opinions, so people would say, oh yeah, Scottish vernacular basketry. Mm, yeah, in Scotland, um, there wasn't really uh, a basketry as a profession. Basketry was actually just done by people who they were doing it for their jobs, uh, for themselves. And then in doing, in doing this, like looking at those blokes, you can see that in Wick, there was basket works, where there were people, and, and there was one, one, one thing that everybody says is, Oh, the herring crown, the quarter crown, which was used for measuring herring all around the UK. The quarter crown is, um, that was only made in Great Yarmouth. And then we discovered that actually some man went up from Leicester to teach people on Sky how to make baskets, although they already knew, but he taught them, obviously. But he, he, he taught them then, how, he particularly showed them how to make these measures, the quarter crown. So it was a, it was a quarter crown workshop in Sky, it was a quarter crown workshop in Wick. We went right up to the very northernmost point of Shetland, to Unst. Amongst Heritage Centre, they had a receipt there which said um, that they'd received these various baskets, including stuff from the blind workshop in, um, uh, in Wick. Um, and so there, there's also like a whole load of other kind of sources of information about who, who actually made the baskets because there's just so much kind of, um, and there's an awful lot of other kind of bits of received wisdom um, about baskets, which through doing this and, and through having the practice and through people coming up and talking to us that we're kind of benefiting from. So, um, yeah, was there much, a few other things perhaps to talk about in relation to what's happened? Has anyone got a long time? Very short time. It's a quarter time. Quarter time. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I suppose really, I suppose just thinking about the future, but I'll just briefly talk about the future. Um, I think one of the issues that people say is, why are you making baskets? What's the point? Baskets are obsolete. You know, they're, they're out of use. They're, they're no longer used. And, and um, we found this at the symposium. At the end of the symposium, we sort of said, what's the point of doing this? You know, uh, we wanted to think about the future, but that was one of the views. And then there's this other view, which is a really classic view, which is, oh yeah, well, if you want baskets to carry on in the UK, um, you've got to make them sexy. How can you make baskets sexy? How can you make them commercial? Um, or maybe you should change them into fine art, you know? And, and it sort of it sort of challenged, it, it kind of crossed all these different categories of what we perceived as being valuable um, and, and how something could be valuable and of value. And so I guess we came to the conclusion that there was a lot more to it than that, that in fact one of the, the big things, the most important things, was this notion of connected, woven communities in that people clearly through People clearly think it's important, we think it's important, and we know other people who think it's important, whether they're museum curators, whether they're basket makers or whatever, just because they're not making baskets now for their living, they still think it's important in some, for some reason to learn about basketry and to also not just learn it in a book, but to learn it through doing it, which is, is what we're, we're doing today. And um, so we, we kind of think that that's one issue that's, that's, that, that we need to explore. That, that people think it's important, and that's good enough. And, and there, there is this intergenerational process. There is, it is important. Skill is important to us as, as human beings. A practical skill is particularly important. And so we kind of fighting really that baskets. We shouldn't just think they're obsolete, and they shouldn't just be um, sexy or made commercial. Um, but we should actually value them for the, the embodied lived skills in them. Uh, and the fact that, that they're there. I know that somebody after us is going to be talking about craftivism and craft activism. And, and I certainly think that, that also the other great thing about any kind of object material culture is that it's kind of a soft politics. It's something there, you immediately touch it, you feel a resonance with it, and you learn about something through it. And um, it was part of every, it mediated all our activities. So I'll perhaps just end with a link to find it. Up. to the final, another, I'll just type this in, uh, another um, person who spoke at the symposium. Who 
because um, I think he sort of summed up really what we thought. We had um, a lot of great, really international speakers, and one of them was a man called Tim Ingold, who some of you might come across. He's based in the University of Aberdeen, and we have at the Spanish quite a lot of things with Aberdeen. And Tim came along, and he's very, very concerned with creativity and anthropology. And so he was very, very enthusiastic, and he summed up the proceedings. Um, I'll just give you a flavour of it as follows. Anyway, thanks. Uh, um, I'm sorry it's so late, and I'm um, sorry I'm also going to be a bit academic as well as crafty, but I, I just wanted to start by, by going back to a very famous uh, work of, of Michael Polanyi, writing in the 1950s, uh, to an, an early 60s, very important book called Personal Knowledge, and then later The Tacit Dimension. And in The Tacit Dimension, Michael Polanyi argued that we can know more than we can tell. And what he, was, what he meant was that, uh, that there's a whole reservoir of what he called personal knowledge, which is embedded in, in craft activities, in the work of skilled practitioners, which we can't actually talk about, uh, which we can't tell. And by telling, I think Polanyi meant that cannot be articulated and cannot be specified. But the fact of the matter is that craftspeople jolly well can tell, and they can, and they do, as many anthropologists know, at very great length. They tell of what they do in stories, in myths, in songs, and in the practice of the craft itself. But the thing about it, about these ways of telling that craftspeople do everywhere, I think, is that there are ways of telling that don't actually specify things in the way that academics like them to be specified, and they don't actually articulate things in the way that academics understand articulation. In other words, craftspeople, or skilled practitioners of any kind, do tell, but their telling is not a practice of specification or a practice of articulation. Because articulation literally means joining up rigid elements into a structure, like an articulated lorry. Or when you put together bits of makana, it means you've got a bit here and a bit there, and you bolt them together, and that's an articulated structure. And when linguists talk about articulate language, they actually have this linguistic model in mind that when we speak, we construct a sentence in our head by bolting together uh, various bits, elements, clauses, phrases, to create this totality which we then enunciate. It's a very strange model uh, of, of speech production that linguists have. But that's what articulation means. But, what the, but, but when, when craftspeople or skilled practitioners of any kind tell, they don't tell in that kind of way. I think their telling is, is more like uh, telling a story. And the thing about storytelling is that the story is, is, is a path. It's a pathway. When you hear the story, you don't necessarily know exactly what it means, but later on you might find yourself in a situation which you say, oh, that was what that story was about, and then that story perhaps suggests how you might carry on from there. So a story is, 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 is rather like this. Here's a story. It will take you so far. And then you're aware now. Then you pick up another story, and it'll take you a bit further. And then you pick up another one, and it'll take you a bit further, like that. And so you can carry on. Now, just recently, for so, TV, And so on and so on. Um, perhaps you can get the visual metaphor, really, having just made a piece of rope, that those kind of stories, very much overlapping stories, at times when we work together and, and do things together, making things in action or practicing in action. Could everybody please take their twine home and show it to their fans? Yes. <laughs> we will right. we'll give it to them. You need to trim it up. Just to if you want to carry on, take some materials. <laughs> yeah, like like we don't want to take it back with us. <laughs> <laughs> We're not taking it back on the train. Thank you very much.